Hi, and welcome back to my Physics Online Video Lecture Supplement Series. In today's video, I'm going to be starting a new lecture set, which is on electromagnetic induction. And the key law that we're going to be looking at in today's lectures is Faraday's law. We'll also look at stuff like Linz's law, which is sort of a, a part of Faraday's law, if you will. The basic idea behind this set of lectures is that we've so far talked about how charges which are in motion, that is a current, will produce a magnetic field. Well, t the point of today's lecture then is sort of the opposite. A magnetic field can be used to induce a current. And basically this is a sort of symmetry, which is uh, a principle that appears throughout nature. So here you see a butterfly and there's some symmetry to this butterfly in the sense that it has two wings that basically mirror each other. And symmetries are uh, a, a phenomenon which exists throughout nature including in physics. Uh, if an electric current can produce a magnetic field then might not a magnetic field produce an electric current? And the answer is yes, yes it does. But this happens if the magnetic field is not constant in time. And in fact actually the condition is slightly more complex even than that. So in today's part of the lecture I wanted to talk about Faraday's law and Basically, that's a law that's going to govern how a changing magnetic field will induce a current. And as we're going to find out, it's not a changing magnetic field per se, it's a changing flux from a magnetic field. So this law is named after Michael Faraday, who is the first person to uh, demonstrate and record that a changing magnetic field can induce a current. What he basically did was he used a transformer, which is shown here, uh, that basically has a primary circuit and a secondary circuit. And what that consists of is he has a battery, which is hooked up to the primary circuit, which basically consists of a coiled wire wrapped around an iron core. And then there's a switch that can be thrown on or off. And what he found was so then there's a secondary coil wrapped around the iron core and then connected to an ammeter. And what he found was if he throws the switch, that instantly produces a voltage that wasn't previously there across this wire. So therefore some current starts to flow through the wire. And that current produces a magnetic field. In fact, this is basically a toroid with an iron core and as you'll recall placing the iron core in it actually strongly enhances the magnetic field and what happened was that he then measured some current in this secondary coil which is not electrically connected to the primary coil so some current was registered on this ammeter and it turns out that you not only induce a current you also in order to do that have to induce a potential difference across the conductor uh, basically an EMF of some sort to drive that current and so what Faraday did was he then determined a quantitative relationship between the changing magnetic field flux through these coils and uh, basically then later found that also you could induce a potential difference across a conductor by moving it through a magnetic field. So let's look at that experiment in just a little more depth. Faraday's experimental apparatus was pretty simple. Again, it consisted of something that could measure current, an ammeter or galvanometer, which is connected to a coiled wire that is electrically isolated from other sources. So there's no voltage source here in this circuit. Then he has a second coil of wire, the actual primary coil, uh, 
which is connected to a battery with a switch. And then he runs an iron core around, which is there, again, to increase the magnetic field strength produced by this current in this wire. So when, when you have this particular circuit, when the switch is open, there's no current flowing, and the result of that is that there should be no magnetic field produced. There's no moving charges, hence no magnetic field. When the switch is thrown, charges begin moving, and that produces a magnetic field. And as you know, the magnetic field is, yes, inside of these coils, but because these coils are more nearly a solenoid than a toroid, since they're not really wrapped all the way around this uh, iron core, the result is that there will be some magnetic field lines that loop around like this, or that loop around like this, as the case may be. And so there are some field lines produced by that that pass through these coils, through the iron core in these coils. The secondary coil, again, is not connected to a battery or e any other EMF force uh, source. But what happens is that when the switch is thrown, the galvanometer deflects momentarily. So it registers some current if the switch is open and closed suddenly. And basically opening or closing the switch in the primary circuit changes the current for the primary coil. It's either zero when the switch is open or not zero when the switch is closed. And hence you have the magnetic field changing in both sets of coils. So what this does is when the switch is opened, the magnetic field has to be reduced, and what happens is the galvanometer actually starts reading a positive current. When the switch is first closed, the magnetic field increases, and the galvanometer starts reading a negative current, which basically means that the current has reversed directions, and hence any magnetic field in produced by this coil will also have reversed directions. And the conclusion that he drew with this is that by changing the magnetic field he has induced an EMF and hence a current in the secondary coil. Faraday's experiment basically used a single battery and a switch which basically means he had a DC source but you could also imagine removing the switch and just having this wire connected but hooked up to an AC source and what would happen therefore is that the current would be changing within this wire according to the equation that I introduced in a previous lecture for the alternating current, namely current equals some maximum current times the sine of some angular frequency times time. So that would also produce a changing current, hence a changing magnetic field, and then you'd actually get some induced current over here with interesting changes in this galvanometer reading throughout. There is, in fact, another method for, for inducing current in a magnetic field, and this one actually does not require the use of any battery or voltage source, AC source, anything like that. Basically, what happens is you put a loop of wire like this into a magnetic field, and this loop of wire is connected to a pair of little ringlets and the ringlets are then connected to a pair of carbon brushes which then connect to a galvanometer. So basically each ring is connected only to one end of the wire. It's not touching the other end of the wire and the use of the ring is that as you rotate this thing this ring is always in contact with the carbon brush, this ring is always in contact with this carbon brush, and hence you'll always get current uh, if there is any to measure. So you insert this ring into a magnetic field. This is like a pair of bar magnets, for example. North pole, south pole for a pair of bar magnets. And this coil is in the magnetic field and you rotate the coil by mechanical means. And so what that does is that at some points the field is perpendicular to the area enclosed by this coil. At some points the field is parallel to the area enclosed by this coil. And most of the time it's somewhere in between. 
And as you rotate this thing in the coil, you produce a measurable alternating current. This, by the way, we'll talk about later, is the basis for making an AC generator. We've talked about DC motors previously. That is to convert from having current or basically electrical energy into something that can do mechanical work. A generator does the opposite. It goes from having mechanical work to producing electrical energy. So what is it that's actually changing in the case of this second method of producing a current? The magnetic field is basically uniform and constant here. Uh, the, the externally produced magnetic field is not changing in time, it's not changing in space, so it's not a change in the magnetic field per se that is causing this induced current. Instead, what happens is that the magnetic flux through the loop is actually changing. You know, recall that in general, flux is given by whatever the vector field is dotted with the area of of interest. So in this case you have a magnetic field B and the area is the area enclosed by the loop. So you could imagine these four sides as being the wires making up the loop. And so the area is whatever the area that is enclosed by those four sides is. And so the flux is B dot A and is basically B times A times cosine of theta, where theta is the angle between the area vector and the magnetic field vector. Recall again that the area vector is perpendicular to the plane in which the actual area is contained. And this has basically the exact same form as the electric field flux that we found earlier. I mentioned in my previous set of lectures that the SI unit for magnetic field flux is the Weber. Uh, one Weber is a Tesla meter squared. So that is magnetic flux in a nutshell. Now let's think of the magnetic field lines uh, and the flux produced here. Uh, recall when we talked about electric field lines that you could visualize what the flux from an electric field is by looking at how many lines puncture through or penetrate through the surface. And if they are going one way through the surface, they count as positive, and if they go the other way through the surface, they count as negative. So the flux is the same for magnetic fields in that it's proportional to the number of magnetic field lines that uh, pass through the surface. So looking at this right here, you can see if the surface is perpendicular to the field lines for a given area, it's going to have the maximum number of field lines that pass through it. When it's parallel to the surface, there will be zero field lines passing through it. And so that basically means that the area vector here would be pointing straight up or straight down whichever may be the case, is perpendicular to the field lines. In this case, it's pointing this way or pointing this way. It's parallel to the field lines. And it's worth noting, in addition to all this, that if we added some more loops, that would be like adding a few more surfaces in here. And so if you have n identical loops, then the area is multiplied by n. So if this thing has an area A, then N of this thing has an area of N times A. And so hence, the flux will have increased by a multiple of N. In this case, it increases from 0 to 0 times N, so still 0. In this case, it is B times A, where B is the magnetic field strength, A is the area of the loop, times N. And that's also true for flux with electric fields, but here we're more concerned about magnetic flux. So Faraday's law actually gives the induced EMF as a 
as a function of the number of coils in the loop and of the change in flux per unit time. So the average induced EMF would be negative N, that's number of loops in the coil, times the change in magnetic field flux per unit time. So this would be change in the product of B times A times cosine of theta per unit time. So what that's basically saying is if you have a coil, you have a, a galvanometer or something else that you can use to measure currents or voltages, an ammeter, a voltmeter, what have you, then you can detect a, a uh, induced current by doing any number of things. One is that you can move the magnetic field or basically move the magnet so that more field lines are puncturing through or fewer field lines are puncturing through or so that uh, m more are puncturing one way or more are puncturing the other way and any of those will be a change in flux per unit time and so you'll induce a current. You can do the same thing by moving the coil itself and of course you can also do this by either rotating the magnet or rotating the coil because that will change the angle theta between the area vector for the coil and the local magnetic field and last but not least you can actually do this also by decreasing the size of the coil which is something that we'll talk about later so you can induce a current by changing the size of the coil while holding the magnet steady and holding the coil otherwise steady because you've reduced the area or you've increased the area. So that gives you the average induced EMF. Uh, by the way, if you're looking for what's the current, because that's what the galvanometer is actually going to measure for us, or an ammeter would actually measure for us, then you just need to know what is the total resistance of the coil because this divided by the resistance should give us the actual current. So this is again an average EMF. If you want to get a good approximation of an instantaneous EMF, you do this very rapidly, so over a very short amount of time. What does an instantaneous EMF end up looking like? Well, very rapidly basically means you're taking a derivative. And since the flux B is the integral of B dot dA, the induced EMF is basically the derivative D by DT of the integral B dot dA. Notice that we are taking a derivative of an integral, but we're taking a derivative with respect to time and an integral with respect to area, which is two length parameters. So this is not a case of, hey, we've done a derivative of an integral, so we can get rid of both the derivative and the integral. You're integrating with respect to something other than what you're differentiating with respect to. So you have to do both of these steps in the event that you actually need to do an integral to find the flux, which would be the case, incidentally, on the uh, these images because you don't have a constant magnetic field across the entire area. If the loop in question is actually enclosing a uniform field, then this simplifies a bit to just induced EMF is negative N times D by DT of BA cosine theta. B again is magnetic field strength, A is area enclosed by the loop, N is number of coils or turns within the loop, and theta is the angle between the area vector, which is perpendicular to the plane containing the loop, or containing one loop of the coil, and the magnetic field. So if you want to induce an EMF, then you can change any one of these three parameters in time. As long as at least one of these parameters is changing in time, then there will actually be a non-zero derivative, and hence you will have an induced EMF. This brings me to Linz's Law. So I mentioned that Linz's Law was a part of Faraday's Law earlier on. It's actually the point of the minus sign in Faraday's law comes from Linz's law. Linz's law is there to just tell us the direction in which the 
magnetic field will be inducing a current. And basically, it, there's kind of two things to this historically. One is that Faraday's law only really predicts the presence of a current as such. So when Faraday wrote his law, all he predicted was there will be an induced EMF and or an induced current. And I don't know actually whether he predicted the direction. I imagine if he was using a galvanometer that he did in fact predict the direction. What Linz has done, and the reason why he's credited with a separate law here, is he explained exactly why it is that we have the direction that is the way that it is, I mean, namely with this minus sign. And what his explanation is, is that when you induce an EMF and you produce a current, that induced current is going to itself produce a magnetic field. And he noticed that the magnetic field that is produced, which might be called the induced magnetic field, is going to also have a flux through the loop in such a way that the flux that is induced will oppose the change in the previously existing magnetic field flux. So there's ultimately two magnetic fields now. The original field B, which might be changing, and an induced magnetic field B induced, which also may be changing. And these two fields may be in the same direction or they may be in opposite directions, but the thing that determines the direction of the induced field is that it also has a flux through the loop and that flux should be in the opposite direction as the change in flux of the original field. So what that means is if you have reduced the magnetic field flux by this field B, then the induced field must add flux in the same direction as the original flux from B. If you are increasing the flux due to this field B, then the induced field must be in the opposite direction. Or in other words, it must produce a flux that is in the opposite direction of the increasing field. And so it, it does not mean that the total flux through the uh, loop is zero or is constant in time. The total change in flux is zero or the total flux is zero in time. What it does mean is that changes in flux will always end up being less than the amount that would have otherwise been predicted without having this in induced current. So let's look at a couple of short examples now for, for all of this. Our first example for Linz's law asks, in which direction will the induced magnetic field point? So let's look at each of these in turn. First of all, we have a magnetic field which is pointing up out of the screen towards us. And we have that this wire is moving in this direction in the magnetic field. Now, you may be thinking, okay, I, I don't know what direction this uh, induced field should be uh, based just on this, but notice that as this thing moves, the field lines are getting farther apart. That means that the field is getting weaker and hence the induced magnetic field needs to be pointing out of the screen at us as well. So be induced is going to be like this. And that is because our uh, flux would be getting weaker as this loop travels through this field. And, and it is getting weaker because there are fewer field lines passing through it if it comes to over here. So if I draw the same loop over here, same size of loop, roughly. Here you see one, two, three, four, five, six. Here one, two, you know, another half, maybe another half, something like two or three 
actual whole field lines through it. So that means that the flux has decreased and so the induced flux needs to be in the same direction as this initial flux is because the, the induced flux is has to oppose this change in flux. Okay, in the second case, the loop is actually moving parallel to the field. And what that means is that the flux initially is zero and it's finally zero. And so there is no induced field. So B induced is equal to zero. In this third case, you have that the north pole is this way. So the flux actually is, I guess you could say positive through this field. And we're moving this magnet in this direction. That means that more field lines are ultimately going to be passing through the magnet because again, there's also a field line like this. There's also a field line like this and so on. So these field lines initially are not moving through this magnet. As the magnet moves this way, more field lines are going to be passing through this loop. So that implies that the flux is actually increasing. And so to counter that, the induced magnetic field would basically be in this direction, B induced, because it wants to resist that change in magnetic flux. Second set of examples asks, in which direction is the current going to be induced? So again, worth drawing in here what way are the induced magnetic fields going to be. So this is B induced and this is B induced. So the question here is basically what direction would you need to have a current moving around the loop in order to get the field to be in this direction. So here is our loop, here is our induced field. And what we do is we use the right hand rule. And the right hand rule basically says, point your thumb in the direction of the induced magnetic field line. And now your fingers will curl around in the direction that the current should be moving in. So the current is actually gonna be like this. So that's I induced. Over here, the basic thing is that the field is in this direction. So you'd need to point your thumb in this direction and wrap your fingers around to get the direction in which the current will be induced. So the current is basically running around like this. So there's I induced. Here again, the induced field is zero and therefore the induced current is also zero. One useful application of Faraday's law is what's called the ground fault interrupter, sometimes abbreviated GFI. And it's basically an electrical safety device which is there to prevent you from shocking yourself if you're using something electric like a hair dryer, for example, or um, what have you nearby a plumbing fixture. So you, you especially see these either placed in or even built into the wall in bathrooms where you might hook up a, a blow dryer or a curler or what have you to an outlet that's right next to a sink. And how it works is that you have two wires from the ground fault interrupter and they're carrying currents of equal magnitude but in opposite direction. So here is your setup. Here's wire one, here's wire two. And therefore, because these two currents are in opposite direction, the magnetic field that's been produced by these two currents is basically going to be in opposite directions. And hence, there's effectively zero magnetic field running through this coil. There's the iron ring surrounding the coil, which is there, again, to enhance the magnetic field. Of course, if it's zero, then it's still zero. Um, now, if an appliance short circuits, what that means is that there's no longer a return current. So basically, this uh, incoming current goes through the appliance 
then it comes back this way. If the appliance short circuits, that means there's no current coming back this way, only a current going this way. And if that happens, then essentially you're going to be shocking yourself by holding on to that appliance. But because of this GFI, the lack of this return current means that suddenly there is a non-zero field moving through the sensing coils. And so that induces a, an EMF, it induces some current, and the result of that is that it trips the circuit breaker, which cuts off the electrical supply to the device that you're holding, thereby hopefully preventing you from electrocuting yourself, especially if you're sort of standing over a sink or that kind of thing and there's water nearby to contribute some extra current some extra electrons for current for you. So here's a basic illustration of what that might look like. You have a ground fault interrupter which plugs into your wall outlet. You have your appliance that plugs into the ground fault interrupter. And if for some reason there was a short somewhere in this, then it basically means that the person touching it is now the path to ground as opposed to the return wire which should normally be the path to ground for an electron and so you basically get shocked. The ground fault interrupter prevents that from happening by basically cutting off the incoming electrons or outgoing current and you see these you can buy them if you want to plug it into a normal wall outlet but if you have if you go to a hotel or even some apartment houses, that kind of thing, you might see, especially in the bathrooms, that the wall outlets look something like this. And what that basically means is that there's a built-in ground fault interrupter into this wall outlet. We've already seen that a changing magnetic field flux induces an EMF and a current in a closed loop. If you're going to induce a current, the implication is that you have some electric field to drive that current. The other implication, by the way, is EMF, recall, is a voltage drop. And recall that electric field magnitude is given by change in voltage, or voltage drop, over change in X. In other words, voltage drop per unit length. So both of those cases give an implication, which is that a changing magnetic field flux is going to induce an electric field within your loop. And Faraday's law, therefore, can be given a more general form, namely that the induced EMF is given by the line integral E dot DL around the loop and of course is also equal to negative d phi dt times n if you have n windings on this loop. And so the general form of Faraday's law is that the line integral e dot dl is in fact equal to negative of the derivative of the magnetic field flux with respect to time. It's worth stating here also that this induced electric field is not necessarily a conservative field. That's contrary to a normally produced static electric field. Normally a static electric field, if you move an object from one point in the field to another point in the field and then move back, the net amount of work that you do is zero. In other words, you do some work against the field and then the field does some work against you or vice versa and you end up with a net change in potential energy of zero. If you have a field, an electric field which has been induced, you'll notice that the field is not necessarily pointing in the same direction everywhere. In fact the field here is in the counterclockwise direction and hence if you were to move a particle, a charged particle, say a proton, around this loop until you got back to where you started with, 
a net amount of work will have been done by the electric field. And so if this electric field was actually to be held constant somehow, it's kind of difficult to do under this setup, but bear with me, then in fact work would be done on your charged particle for every lap around this ring that it makes. And so it would just keep accelerating and accelerating and accelerating. Now with that said, because you need to have a changing magnetic field in time in order to do this, one result is that the E-field strength is not necessarily constant here. In fact, it's very likely to be variable, and if you're producing it by an alternating current, the E-field might even reverse direction, so that after making a couple laps, you may in fact have done a net amount of work of zero. But making one whole lap if it, as long as the E-field hasn't reduced directions in that time, you actually will have done a net amount of work. I wanted to work through a slightly longer example that actually makes use of Faraday's law instead of just Lenz's law. So we're going to consider a solenoid in a magnetic field, and the magnetic field is actually changing. And so the question is, what will be the induced EMF current and magnetic field for this solenoid. Recall that a solenoid is basically a series of turns of wire. So this right here looks like kind of a loosely wound solenoid. Ideally it's a little more tightly wound than this. So we're going to consider this solenoid to be a sort of ideal solenoid. So what we're going to do is we're going to look for an end-on view of these turns. And what we've been told is that the radius of one of these turns is 0 0.0125 meters. We're told that the total length of this is 1.000 meters and that it is has 1,500 turns to it. And so what we're supposed to do here is figure out what is the induced EMF and what is the induced current, what is the induced magnetic field. So let's draw what our magnetic field basically is looking like here. So our magnetic field we're assuming is sort of uniform and pointing out of the page at us uh, since that is how the coil is set up. So our magnetic field is basically like this. And this magnetic field is decreasing. So implication of the fact that this is decreasing is the fact that therefore the induced magnetic field will also be out of the page towards us. So that actually gives us the direction of the induced field the induced field will be like this, so B induced. The induced current, point your thumb out of the page for your right hand, wrap your fingers around the uh, coil, so here is the induced current direction. And let's now find some magnitudes. So the magnitudes we can find by using that the average induced current is going to be N times delta phi B over delta T. And according to Lenz's law, this whole thing should be negative. And in fact, since we have a, a constant rate at which the magnetic field is going to be uh, changed, this average is also equal to the instantaneously induced uh, potential or EMF. So we have N, we have T, delta T was given as 2.00 seconds. Delta phi basically is going to be delta of B dot a. And so that basically is B initial times A 
times cosine of the angle between them. But as you can see here, the initial, uh, the cosine of the angle should be zero because this right here is the area vector. So we'd have B initial, or excuse me, B final times A minus B initial times A. And B final is zero. So we basically just need to use the fact that the initial field, uh, excuse me, the uh, that's backwards. My initial field is zero because we're increasing the field from zero to one Tesla. So this is zero, this is 1.00 Tesla. Okay, so what we need now is to find the area. Well, area is pi r squared because it is a circular solenoid. So that would be pi times 1.25 uh, by 10 to the negative 2 meters squared. So what is this going to give us? It's going to give us a total area of approximately 4.90873, so 4.909 times 10 to the minus 4 square meters. So that means that the delta flux in this case is going to be 1.00 teslas times 4.909 by 10 to the minus 4 square meters. And so that is basically 4.909 times 10 to the minus 4. Recall that the unit is Weber's, that's Tesla dot meter squared. So this means that our induced EMF, and again, since it's at a constant rate, this induced EMF instantaneously and the induced EMF on average should be equal is going to be negative of 1500 turns times 4.909 by 10 to the minus four Weber's per 2.00 seconds. And so that means that the induced EMF is gonna be approximately 0 0.368175. So our induced EMF, probably we would put this many volts. And now the second question, so this was A. Part B is what is the induced current going to be? So let's do part B. And part B, basically what we can use is that the induced current, I induced, is equal to E induced, or EMF induced, over R. So 0 0.368 volts divided by 25.0 ohms. So if we divide this by 25, we get that the induced current is approximately 0 0.014727 amps. So that is, of course, a measurable current. That would be 14.7 milliamps for what that's worth. So part C then asks, what is the expected magnetic field in the middle of this solenoid going to be? Now recall, and if you don't recall, I wrote it down on the original uh, question. For a solenoid, the B field is equal to N mu naught I over L which is also mu naught little n i. That's number of turns times the uh, permeability of free space times the current divided by the total length. And so we'll actually want to use maybe this equation because we have n and l. Uh, it doesn't matter, both are going to give us the same answer. So 
the induced magnetic field in mu naught I induced over L. So we have 1500 turns times 4 pi by 10 to the negative 7 Tesla dot uh, meters squared per amp times 0.0147 amps and then the length was given as 100.0 centimeters so that would be 1.000 meters so this gives us a total of uh, induced field strength would be zero uh, let's just write it in scientific notation 2.77 times 10 to the negative uh, 5 Teslas. So that is what our induced magnetic field strength would be. Um, I should state here that I was misreading the problem when I first labeled this diagram. I I somehow flipped from starting at zero Tesla to ending at one Tesla. Somehow I misread that as starting at one Tesla and ending at zero Tesla. So actually the induced magnetic field and the induced current are in the opposite direction that I initially said they'd be in. Uh, again, that's because I miss, I sort of transposed the order. Uh, as you probably noticed before when I was first trying to write down what the two uh, fields were. So in fact the induced magnetic field is into the page, the induced current should be clockwise not counterclockwise. So we have come to near the end of this part of the lecture so it's worth giving a summary of the new terms and equations which were introduced. The first of which is that the magnetic field flux phi b through an area is given by the magnetic field dotted with the area vector. That basically looks like this for a generic non-uniform field. Of course, if it's a uniform field, this reduces to just b dot a and no integral. This was actually introduced in the last set of lectures, but I never did anything with it until this set of lectures. The unit is the Weber. One Weber is a Tesla meter squared. If you change this flux then you will induce an EMF and a current around a loop that's inside of that field and the magnitude of the induced EMF is basically governed by Faraday's law basically says that the induced EMF is equal to negative of the number of loops times the derivative of the flux with respect to time so change in flux per unit time. The direction is governed by this negative sign and was explained in Linz's law, namely that the induced current is going to produce a magnetic field and the flux of that magnetic field that has been induced is going to be negative of the change in flux from the existing magnetic field. Uh, worth noting here, this equation is not exactly correct. It says it's equal to, it's not so much equal to as in the same direction uh, as, but I don't have a nice way of showing that with an equation. So don't think that the induced magnetic field is actually equal to the change in magnetic field. It's just simply such that the direction of this magnetic field will produce a flux whose sign is opposite that of the change in the initial magnetic field. I also never explicitly showed this equation in the notes, just in the example that I worked at the end. The induced current is given by the induced EMF divided by the resistance of the total uh, coil of wire through which that current is being induced. Last but not least, a changing magnetic field flux also induces an electric field so Faraday's law can in fact be written in this form. The line integral of the induced electric field dotted with dl is equal to negative of the number of loops around which this is happening times the derivative with respect to time 
of the flux for magnetic field. So that concludes the first part of this lecture on induced uh, current and induced voltage, induced EMF, induced fields. Uh, Faraday's law is the main takeaway with Linz's law being a important conceptual component of that. In the next part of this lecture we're going to look at motional EMF and we're going to look at some applications of EMF, uh, excuse me, of induced EMF and of really of Faraday's law. We of course already looked at one application which was the ground fault interrupter and I alluded to a second application which is the electrical generator. We'll see a little more of that in the next set of lectures. So I hope you found this uh, video helpful. Thanks for watching.